Hello, once again, this is Dr. Joseph Walrath. I'm going to talk with you about upper eyelid ptosis repair. This is another video in my series of teaching videos for patients and prospective clients. Um, this goes along with a more basic video that talks about the difference between ptosis and blepharoplasty and brow lift, but this part specifically focuses on ptosis. That's drooping of the eyelid margin where the lashes come off blocking the vision. Once again, this is Joseph Walrath. I'm an oculoplastic surgeon. I'm a specialist in eyelid surgery. I don't do butt lifts, breast lifts, face lifts, just eyelid surgery, and I do a thousand cases a year. What is ptosis? And again, pro tip, silent P, pronounced ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. Ptosis is when the muscle that lifts the eyelid when you're trying to open your eyes doesn't work right. And it can not work right for a couple reasons. It can slip a tendon or stretch a tendon. That's the most common cause. And that's the most common cause when someone wears contact lenses for 20 years or they get up in age. You can have ptosis as a consequence of scarring from injury or perhaps you've had prior surgery that caused scarring. Now, some patients have a muscle that was never formed right at birth. That's called congenital ptosis. And finally, some kinds of ptosis can be important from a medical standpoint. Ptosis can be due to serious health problems, and that's not common at all. But you have to look for it to see it. So that's why you need an oculoplastic surgeon to assess your ptosis, to make sure that it's just wear and tear and not something that needs a brain scan or blood tests or a neurological consult. I'm going to talk with you about the basics of ptosis surgery today. Insurance often covers ptosis if it's bad enough. So if the lid gets down to the level of pupil and blocks it, that's generally covered. Surgery to correct ptosis takes 10 to 20 minutes per side depending on the technique. And there are several different techniques which I'm going to talk about. Most of the lid droop repairs or ptosis repairs have a success rate of 92 to 93%, which means there's a 6-7% risk of reoperation. And again, I'm going to talk with you about the four methods that I use to fix Totic eyelids. So there are three things that lift the eyelid. There are two muscles within the eyelid, each of which can be used to lift the eyelid. And the eyebrow also does some of the lifting of the eyelid. So the levator muscle is one of the muscles in the eyelid. That's the most important, and that's depicted in blue on the diagram. That's a profile diagram where you see the eyelashes and skin on the right side of the screen moving toward the eye on the left side of the screen. The Mueller's muscle is that orange muscle underneath the blue muscle. That's the second muscle that lifts the eyelid. And each of these can be a target for surgery, or in fact, both of them can be a target for surgery at the same time. So this is the levator muscle surgery, that blue muscle. There's a skin incision in the lid crease coming from the right side toward the left, where I find that blue tendon and tighten it. Now with that surgery, typically I ask the patient to sit up in the middle of surgery. The advantage of this surgery, uh, in terms of other types of eyelid surgeries, is this surgery is less likely than other techniques to worsen your dry eye. It's good for significant eye droop. And since we're making a skin incision, the extra skin can be removed at the same time. The Mueller muscle is the internal ptosis surgery. Now you can see that that surgery is closer to the inside of the eyelid. And to get at that muscle, I actually flip the eyelid and tighten it from the inside. Now, what's the advantage of that? The lid contour often is a little more natural, all comers, with that particular surgery. It's really suited for small degrees of droop. It has pretty fast healing. In some patients, it can lead to some increased dryness, and I always try to sort that out preoperatively to make sure that's the best procedure. In terms of these two techniques, I do these perhaps 450 times a year. You can see a video of internal ptosis surgery on my website done while the patient is awake. It sounds really weird, and it is, but in general, it's a comfortable surgery and not that big a deal to have that done either awake or asleep. I'm gonna show you some pictures of patients before and after surgery to correct their run-of-the-mill ptosis. When I say run-of-the-mill ptosis, what I mean is this is ptosis that's not due to an aneurysm, a neuromuscular disease, a muscular dystrophy. It's not due to congenital ptosis. None of that tricky stuff. This is really 
the kind of ptosis that happens when you stretch out your eyelid muscles from chronic contact lens wear, lots of eye rubbing or just getting older. All the patients that you see are patients of mine, my surgery patients, and they've all given their consent to have their photos shared in this manner. Now this is a woman with a drooping eyelid, her left eyelid. She had internal ptosis repair, which insurance paid for, to make left look like right. I said, look, I can remove some extra skin on that left side at the same time, but you'd have to do it on the right side and I'd have to bill you for it. She said, nah, just make my left look like my right. And that's what I did. This next patient is an Asian patient with both lids in the pupil. This is after lifting the lids uh, with a ptosis repair as well as Asian blepharoplasty and lid crease fixation. This was medical because the lids were blocking part of the pupil. This is a patient who elected to have external ptosis repair. Now in general, I consider this level of droop too severe to be correctable by internal ptosis repair with my technique. She also wanted to have her lower lid blepharoplasty done at the same time. That was cosmetic. So the medical, lids, uh, medical procedure was the upper eyelids and that was covered. The cosmetic procedure was the lower eyelids and this is after surgery. Her upper eyelids are open and her lower eyelids are smooth with extra tissue reduced. This next patient had severe ptosis, and this is before external ptosis repair. Again, this patient had too much droop for internal ptosis repair, and since she had extra tissue, she elected to have it removed at the same time. This is after external ptosis repair, two months after surgery. This is another patient with droop. As you can see, the lids where the lashes come off are blocking the very top of the pupil, making this a medical case. This is two months after external ptosis repair. This is a woman before internal ptosis repair. She had a slight degree of droop. This was also combined with upper blepharoplasty and lower blepharoplasty at the same time. This was all cosmetic. This is severe ptosis, and her ptosis was due to chronic hard contact lens wear. As you can see, the contact lenses are still in. You can see the little rim of contact lenses in each eye. She also elected to have a cosmetic lower blepharoplasty at the same time. This is after surgery, opening the eyelids and reducing the extra tissue from the lower lids. This is a more complicated case where there's an imbalance in lid height. This gentleman had already had ptosis repair on the left side elsewhere. And there was a significant difference in both the appearance of the lid fold and the lid height. In this patient, he underwent internal ptosis repair on the right side, but then Asian blepharoplasty on both upper lids to make right look like left. This is a patient with a slight degree of ptosis. We can still see some of the iris above the pupil, so this was not medical, it was cosmetic. She also had some extra skin hanging down. And this is after using internal ptosis to get a slight lift and then doing a blepharoplasty to remove that extra skin that was hanging down onto the lashes. Moving along to what I call complex ptosis. Complex ptosis is more challenging and more specialized to people like me because it involves a greater understanding of the eyelid anatomy. In these cases, the patients have probably had prior surgery, which has traumatized them, or they've had trauma. The tissue planes are more difficult to tease apart. They may have been born with muscles that simply don't work properly. In this case, I remove both muscles with a single surgery. I don't just remove the levator muscle in blue, and I don't just release the Mueller's muscle. In fact, for complex surgery, those two are often fused together as a single scar, and consequently, I actually release both of them and advance both of them. Now, complex ptosis repair is suitable for people who have eyelid function that is reduced even to 40, 50, 60% reduction from normal. I'm going to show you now a gallery of before and after photos of patients who have had complex ptosis that I've repaired. Again, all of these patients are mine. This is congenital ptosis. This is a boy who was born with a lid droop that was severe in both sides. And you can tell on the left side of the screen that that is the droopier eye because even though the lid is about the same height as the other side, his eyebrow is really high 
on the left side of the screen, meaning he really wants to get that lit up and he just can't. This is after complex ptosis repair, levator resection surgery. This is a woman with her left eye uh, not functioning properly since birth, the right side of the screen. And you can tell a few things. The lid is low in the pupil and the brow is really high on that side. It causes her to look asymmetric even more because you see less of the fold. The skin fold is missing because the brow is pulled up and the lid is pulled down and the skin is stretched out. She elected to have a medical left upper lid complex ptosis repair and a matching right upper lid blepharoplasty to make right look like left. We're now moving to the final class of ptosis repair. For run-of-the-mill ptosis, the lid function is pretty normal, but the, the lid is just stretched out. For complex ptosis, the lid function can be only a third of normal, and the lid just doesn't move. But when you get below that, when the functional lid is even worse than that, you no longer can do isolated eyelid surgery. You have to use the only muscle in the area which works properly, which is typically the eyebrow. So frontalis sling ptosis repair uses the eyebrow to lift the lid because the lid muscles themselves don't work properly at all. The way I perform the surgery is I implant a silicone rod through an incision in the eyelid, which is marked in red, and through three small incisions above the brow, also marked in red. And when the patient lifts the brow, the eyelid lifts, and the patient relaxes the brow, the eyelid closes. This sounds like a crazy kind of surgery, but it actually works. I'm going to show you pictures of it. Again, before and after gallery, these are patients who've had frontalis suspension surgery by me. This is a gentleman before frontalis suspension repair. Uh, he had a complicated problem. His eyelids did not lift properly because of a muscular dystrophy. In addition, his eyeballs did not roll back into his head when he tried to close his eyes. That's called the Bell's phenomenon, also because of the muscular dystrophy. So the eyelids looked straight ahead, didn't move much. And this is a guy who was going to get really dry eyes if his eyelids didn't close properly. As I said before, with frontalis suspension, you can open the eyelid when you lift the brow, but when you relax the brow, the eyelid should close pretty good. This is him a week after surgery. You can see the incisions, one in each eyelid crease, as well as the small incisions in the brow. This is him closing his eyes by relaxing the brow. This is after surgery. Everyone with lids this droopy uses their brow to lift the lids anyways. This just makes it more effective. This is a young Asian woman with congenital ptosis. She's had prior surgery before that didn't work out that well. And you can see that the lids are really droopy and the brows are up to the ceiling. She's trying as hard as she can to get her eyelids open. They're still not working. This is after surgery two months later, frontalis suspension. The brows have relaxed a little bit and that's given us a little bit of a lid fold, an Asian lid fold, and the lids are higher and more symmetric, and she's done quite well. The message I'm trying to convey to you here is that ptosis can be complex. Every ptosis patient deserves a thoughtful evaluation and a thoughtful examination. There can be medical problems that are hiding in the weeds that need to be teased out. The surgical plan is completely individualized. It, inv it involves the lid height, the lid function, the lid crease and fold, brow position, degree of eye dryness. If your procedure is medical, you can have an office or telemedicine visit, and you might need a visual field test to demonstrate the visual disability if you have commercial insurance. My office will communicate with the insurance company, and we do that quite a bit. A medical clearance will be necessary if a patient's on a blood thinner, as I don't advise any patients to stop life-saving medications without their internist, cardiologist, and neurologist weighing in on that. A review of preoperative instructions can be found on my website. If your procedure is cosmetic, you'll get a surgical quote. And depending on the complexity of the procedure, uh, of which there is a wide range, the quote will vary from three dollars to $5,000 for bilateral surgery. We have care credit interest-free financing. If you have a cosmetic problem, the best solution is usually to have surgery in the office because it's not a bad experience. Patients do well and it saves a bunch of money because you don't need an anesthesiologist for this case. Doing upper eyelid surgery awake is not difficult. This guy had such a good time he wanted a group photo. For your post-operative period, first three days, rest, ice, comfy chair. 
First two weeks, light normal activity, keep the contact lenses out. The first post-operative visit, one to two weeks after surgery, could be office or virtual. Second post-operative visit, if necessary, in the office or virtual telemedicine visit. I typically use dissolvable stitches. This is a typical post-operative experience. This guy uh, was smiling every day, not a great deal of pain. Um, nobody looks good on day two. After day eight, not so bad. This is actually after upper blepharoplasty, some ptosis uh, surgery has uh, some lesser degree of swelling than this. Long-term healing, these are the incisions from external ptosis. The incisions heal quite well. There's really no issues with the incisions. There's a little more risk to upper eyelid ptosis repair than just upper blepharoplasty. For run-of-the-mill ptosis, internal and external ptosis repair, the reoperation rate is 5 to 7%. And that's just because your brain has an idea of where these lids ought to be too, and I try to meet your brain in the middle, and I usually get it right. There is a slight increased infection rate with external ptosis repair. Maybe it's one in a thousand. There is excess bleeding from the blepharoplasty. That's unusual, perhaps one in a thousand. You can imagine that if you're opening the window more, opening the eye more, you can have worsening dry eye. Now, worsening dry eye and impaired eyelid closure is almost always going to happen after complex ptosis repair. And I counsel all of those patients before, including a slit lamp examination to look at the state of dryness of the eye. Those are patients who are at risk for worsening dry eye. And if you're at risk for that, uh, we will talk about it. But in general, the risk of worsening dry eye from internal and external ptosis repair is really quite low. There are specific risks when you implant the silicone rod and do the special frontalis suspension surgery. My revision rate, reoperation rate, is perhaps 20 to 30 percent. It sounds like a huge number, but really what I mean by reoperation is open up a small incision in the forehead and tighten the rubber band in the forehead and be done with it. it takes 10 minutes and helps me fine tune the lid height. So I'll accept that revision rate because it helps me get things just right and it's pretty easy to do. And that's done in the office. The infection rate's about 5%. And when you get an infection from frontalis suspension surgery, it can be a problem because you might have to start over and take that whole silicone rod out. That's happened to me once and it's particularly frustrating, but that risk is quite low. Now, frontalis suspension surgery can cause a worsening dry eye uh, because the lid function itself is really quite poor. But in general, that's something that uh, we're always looking out for. And that requires a preoperative evaluation at the slit lamp in the office to look for dryness. Once again, this has been Dr. Joseph Walrath. This is my team, and we're looking forward to help you, whether your condition is medical or cosmetic. We're going to do our best to help you reach your goals. I look forward to taking care of you.